Well, welcome everyone. We are so excited to be able to kick off the new year with such an incredible case study. All right. Okay, so my name is Kate North. I'm Vice President of Workplace Innovation at Colliers, and um, in 2012, we started the Workplace Evolutionaries as a community of practice within IFMA, because as you know, the whole notion of workplace is exploding, and that the profession isn't emerging, and we felt that there needed to be a professional body where people could go and learn. So we're loving it here at McDonald's. And what we're going to do for this next segment of the presentation is uh, define the vision, the business drivers, and the project overview, and then talk with our illustrious leaders uh, at McDonald's and IA about how they leverage the workplace to support uh, transformation and human experience. And then we'll talk about the metrics, measuring what matters, and uh, the results and the lessons learned. So I'm really delighted to, um, as I said, how many times do you get to have technology, human resources, workplace management, architecture and design, all sitting at the table, ready to share their experience with you in creating this fantastic uh, uh, workplace. So uh, we have, I'm going to have them each do a brief introduction of yourself and what you do here at McDonald's. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jez Langhorn. Jez is short for Jeremy. Um, probably tell by my accent, I'm not a native Chicagoan. Um, I'm born and raised in London, but I've lived in Chicago since 2015. Um, <clears throat> been with McDonald's over 30 years, though. Um, I'm the VP of uh, Center HR, which is one of those job titles that absolutely doesn't describe at all what I do. Um, but I look after the HR support for all of our offices here, our global functions, our US leadership and uh, global leadership teams. And I look after HR for some of our markets around the world in Latin America, Japan, Europe, uh, South America. So that's me. Great. Uh, Tom Grigetz, I'm born and raised a hardy native Chicago individual. Um, so, been with McDonald's, uh, in working in the system for about 30 some years now, 35 years I believe. Uh, I am the global CTO and responsible for the global technologies that we utilize, um, everything from data centers and cloud services to the technology in this building and everything we provide our end users as well too. So we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Awesome. And I'm Neil Schneider. I'm the design director from IA Interior Architects, um, and I led the design effort on the project for McDonald's that you guys got to tour, uh, working with uh, the real estate team, the contractors, um, our strategy team to the development of the facility all the way through. So um, really honored to be part of this group. That's awesome. I'm Scott Phillips. I'm uh, director of corporate real estate here at McDonald's. I've been at McDonald's for about eight years now. Uh, working on this project for what seems like about eight years now. <laughs> um, my team, um, we have uh, the, the, the great uh, pleasure of working with the McDonald staff on uh, all things real estate, uh, facilities, uh, project management. We handle uh, everything outside of the restaurant uh, from the restaurant side of the business. So we handle all of the office environments uh, in uh, the headquarters here as well as throughout the, the U.S. Thank you. And my name is Pat Turnbull. I'm the president of Workplace IQ and also the global co-chair with Kate North of the Workplace Evolutionaries. So, McDonald's has come a long way baby. And Chaz, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about uh, McDonald's today and the journey that you've been on. Okay. Well, we have the privilege of working for a brand that you've probably heard of uh, and uh, probably visited um, hopefully as a child as well maybe you take your your families there um, being in a brand this big though um, has certain responsibilities and we can be quite a polarizing brand um, you know there's a brand called Marmite in the UK and they had this uh, marketing catchphrase saying you love it or hate it um, kind of pushing people and sometimes McDonald's can be a little like that as well um, but we do have a, a long history, uh, right back from when Ray Kroc uh, founded the company. Um, there was two brothers, Dick and Mac McDonald, running a, what was the original McDonald's restaurant, and he loved it, uh, bought, eventually bought that off them, franchised it, and the rest is history. There's a few kind of milestones up on the screen from 
the invention of the Big Mac, our first overseas restaurant, which was actually in Japan, one of our biggest markets outside the US still. Um, uh, 1963, we got to 500 uh, restaurants. A um, couple of recent ones, we served all day breakfast, started that in 2015 in the US, you may remember that. That was the number one uh, request from our customers um, in the US at the time. And right now, we're in uh, 120 countries, uh, 36,000 restaurants, about 80% of which and growing are franchised uh, to uh, individual businessmen and women. And between us in our company and restaurants and the franchises, we employ uh, just over 1.9 million people uh, across the world. So if we're not the biggest employer of young people in the world, primarily, then we are one of the biggest, uh, a responsibility that we take very seriously. Now, transforming an icon is no easy task. So can you tell us a little bit about what was going on with McDonald's and what were the business drivers that led to this massive effort? Yeah, this, we're on a journey and it's not often that a brand as old as ours gets to reinvent itself. But that's really what McDonald's has been doing for the last three years or so. Um, and that's reinventing uh, how we look, how we feel, how we operate. Um, and up here you can see some quotes. This is a picture of Ray Kroc. He was the guy who founded McDonald's. Um, he used to sell shake machines. They're called multi-mixers. And uh, you got interested in McDonald's because they were the only restaurant in the US that wanted to buy two instead of one that everyone else had because they were so busy. Um, and if you go into our HU, you can see one of the original ones down there. These are some of the sayings at the top there, though, that he used to talk about, uh, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, around being customer obsessed. Um, and that, the, you know, the customer is not an interruption of our business, they're the focus of our business. Um, and at the bottom, you can see our, our renewed um, uh, cultural pillars that we launched in 2016. Um, and it's funny, for a business that started off in a very entrepreneurial fashion, I think you could argue we got quite corporate for a while and became this behemoth with you know, millions of people and lots of infrastructure and perhaps lost some of that entrepreneurial spirit um, and that innovation and agility that companies when they're smaller have. And so ironically in the last three, four years we've been going back to our roots, uh, back to the future if you will, um, on reconnecting with that entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, becoming more agile and nimble and focusing on innovation in a much bigger way than we have done um, uh, over the last few years. And so that's, uh, you know, with 1.9 million people, that change doesn't happen overnight. Uh, we're a big ship to turn. But there's several things that we'll talk about today that uh, will demonstrate some of the things we're doing to try and turn that ship and be more agile and in innovative. So, what, sorry. So, one of those uh, big drivers was this idea of access to talent. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about the suburban move to downtown and and just moving 2,500 people, roughly? Yeah. Well, we'll see. When you've been in a, a suburban campus like we were in Oakbrook um, for you know getting on for 50 years moving downtown is quite a big move, you know, not just physically, but culturally and psychologically for our people. You know, many families have just grown up around the Oakbrook area working for McDonald's. Mm. So it's a, it's a really big shift. Um, but we talked about access to talent. You know, in Oakbrook, within 10 miles of Oakbrook, we had access to about 400,000 or so potential employees. By moving to the West Loop within 10 miles, we've got access to about 1.5 million uh, potential employees. And there's a lot of people in Chicago who, who don't want to go out to a suburb. Chicago is a dynamic, thriving city, and people want to work in the city. So uh, by being here, it just gives us greater access to those people that perhaps we didn't have before in Oakbrook. Um, it's also closer to our customers as well. You know, we are we're now in a kind of city area as opposed to being in a leafy, very beautiful you know, uh, complex and campus uh, in Oakbrook. But so uh, we are very remote from people. Um, and it becomes quite insular, I think. And you can kind of forget and connect, how to connect with people, you know, our customers um, and our employees. So um, 
one of, one of the uh, things we've learned being down here is that uh, we're very accessible to anyone who wants to say anything to McDonald's. Um, so you may find them camped outside, you know, on any given day, uh, whereas that's, that's something very different to what we had in Oprah. Yeah. A second driver was driving faster innovation, and I know we all feel like how can it, we're all challenged with how fast everything moves at this point. So moving a corporation the size of McDonald's yeah. is... And my colleagues can talk more to this in, in a second as well, but I talked about disrupting and innovation and being agile. Um, technology is at the heart of how we're doing that. So, you know, whether it's kiosks in our restaurant to make it easier for people to order or mobile order pay or using our um, app to um, order your food and interact with McDonald's to having McDonald's delivered to you. Um, you know, these are all new innovations that are now spreading out uh, amongst the sector. But they're also driving our business very hard. Um, you know, if you back in the day, the only way to order a McDonald's was to walk up to a counter. Then our disruption was adding a drive through window. Um, and we're the first company to do that. Now we have multiple ways to order um, and collect your food, which is, again, broadening the appeal of, uh, and accessibility to McDonald's. And the final big business driver was supporting the culture and brand shift, which you commented on. But yeah. So look, lastly, with culture, and look, I'm the HR guy, although I'm from an operations background, it gets a bit fluffy and warm and you know, not very tangible, culture. It, and it's not often that you get to have a physical manifestation of the culture you want to have. And that's really what this building is about. It's much more than the carpets and the glass and you know, the technology. This is a physical manifestation of the company we want to be and the culture we want to have. Um, so <clears throat> we put a lot of effort and time, obviously, into thinking about the cultural aspects of this building as well as the physical building itself. So, Scott, I can just see you sitting around the C-suite table convincing them that Workplace was going to be able to drive behaviors and support the cultural changes that, you know, that McDonald's wanted to see. Can you talk about uh, what it was like to be in the room? Sure. So, uh, from a Workplace strategy standpoint, as we think about that at McDonald's, uh, you know, and I jokingly said it's been an eight-year project, but when we look back on uh, the, the process that we've gone through to really develop what our workplace strategy has evolved to uh, and, and what we have put in place here in the new headquarters, it really goes back to even two or three years before uh, we signed the lease uh, here uh, at 110 North Carpenter. Uh, we had an opportunity uh, in projects uh, that we did in San Francisco and Oak Brook, uh, a couple of different projects um, in the, the headquarters. Uh, where we had a chance to pilot things and test things uh, to trial. Uh, in fact, our corporate real estate group uh, did a trial uh, in working in unassigned uh, office space, uh, one of the first groups in McDonald's to, uh, to test that out. And it gave us a great view into what works, what doesn't work, the challenges, uh, and, uh, and some of the things that we would face as we looked at this project going forward. Uh, we, we put a, an entire floor of 50,000 square feet together in uh, various uh, collaboration uh, setups and, uh, and, and conference rooms and different furniture configurations. And so, so that was a project that happened, uh, again, two or three years before uh, the headquarters project. So, so it was really a, a journey and a process for us to really hone uh, what our workplace strategy was going to become uh, as we started to move into uh, the headquarters project. And so, for us to be able to execute on what we did in the timeline that we executed in, uh, really having the basis for that workplace strategy was, was critical for us to be able to, uh, to move as quickly as, as we did. And, and when we think about uh, selling it to uh, the executive leadership team, uh, it really comes back to a lot of the things that, uh, that Jez was talking about. If we can't tie it back to the business drivers, uh, then it's uh, maybe a benefit to the corporate real estate group or makes us a little more efficient, but ultimately uh, it's not something that will uh, will sell to, uh, to senior leadership and it's not going to be a part of the, the cultural shift. So when we think about creating space, uh, it was creating space that was dynamic, uh, that would uh, excite people to come to work here every day. Uh, we have a, a remote work uh, policy 
uh, but from a corporate real estate standpoint, we like to think that we're creating a, a so attractive of a workspace that people want to be here and that they can do their best work uh, when they're here in the office. Uh, so it, it's about uh, creating a space to, to bring that talent into. Uh, the collaboration component of that uh, really talks to the speed to market and the pace of our business and everyone else's business these days, uh, but creating a space that would drive collaboration that would make it easy, uh, that would be convenient uh, for our employees to be able to collaborate, whether it's with your neighbor in one of the neighborhoods downstairs or uh, one of your associates that's uh, across the globe uh, being able to do that easily. And, and finally, I would say it's about uh, creating a, an innovation mindset. Uh, so as we look at how do we incorporate technology, what are the decisions that we make around the technology we put into the building, it was really with the mindset of creating an environment where our employees would see that innovation was important to us, and as they go about their role and their day-to-day uh, -day job functions that may directly impact what we're doing in the restaurants, it's creating that notion of innovation is key, and that's, uh, that's what's going to help to, uh, to bring the brand forward. So there's a little uh, slide here that talks about sort of the vision for the new corporate headquarters because, of course, you're visioning out there and, and creating, all of you, creating something that doesn't exist. So can you just comment uh, briefly on sort of that vision for the new HQ? Sure, sure. Um, you know, just thinking about uh, the, the, the relocation from Oak Brook and uh, as, we, as we looked at uh, sites uh, and, and where we felt would be the best fit uh, to really help drive that cultural change, uh, we looked at uh, the West Loop. What we, what we saw in the West Loop was an opportunity uh, with the, the restaurant that we put in place downstairs to get closer to our customers on a daily basis so our employees can walk downstairs on a day-to-day -day basis and, and they're right there with the customer. Uh, we, we think about uh, the, the talent piece, uh, the ability to attract the pool that we've gained and in, in being here in the West Loop. And then the third component is we, that we looked at was when you think about the West Loop area, you think about uh, Randolph Street, you think about West Fulton, uh, the innovation that's going on in the restaurant industry is kind of the epicenter in Chicago is here in, in this neighborhood. And so for McDonald's, uh, you know, we're a, a restaurant company. We, we may express it a little differently than the white tablecloth restaurant down the street, but it's really about understanding the changing tastes, uh, the changing dynamics that are going on with our customers and being closer to what's going on in the restaurant industry certainly helps us uh, to do that. Okay, I've got two pictures. One is of the suburban Oak Brook campus and then a uh, uh, bird's eye view of this building. And I wanted to put it in because I said, you know, these downtown people, they've, many of them have probably never been to Oak Brook, so they don't know what you're talking about. So here is the Oak Brook campus and 50 years of Life there. That's all ours, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, it's yeah. pretty big time. <laughs> <laughs> and then here is your, your urban epicenter, as they say. So very, very nicely done. Yeah, uh, just, you know, just an interesting story about the, the Oak Brook piece. So going back to when McDonald's uh, first looked at building the campus in Oak Brook, uh, Oak Brook as a community was somewhat hesitant to welcome with open arms this burger joint, as they put it, uh, to build their headquarters there. They weren't sure exactly that that's the type of development that they wanted to see in Oak Brook. And so play that forward in a number of years. Uh, they've been very disappointed, obviously, to see McDonald's leave. So uh, the changing dynamic, uh, you know, Oak Brook was, uh, was a, uh, a very important part of McDonald's history. Uh, but I think as we, as we look at the West Loop, uh, the changing culture going forward is what's going to help drive that. So tell us a little bit about the, um, the project stats and the, t and the timeline for this HQ project. Sure, sure. So um, uh, very, very fast-paced project. Um, first of all, we're just under a half a million square feet. Uh, so we're the single office tenant here in the building. Uh, we occupy uh, floors uh, two through uh, the, the ninth floor here. Uh, we have uh, 40,000 or so square feet of, uh, of kitchen space, uh, another 40,000 square feet of conference center space, outdoor terrace space. If you come back uh, when it's a little nicer weather, uh, we invite you to, to join us out on the terrace uh, for events like this. Um, but obviously a, a very complex project and uh, the size and scale. 
We signed the lease uh, with Sterling Bay uh, as our uh, landlord and developer in uh, June of 2016, and we were fully moved into the space by June of 2018. Uh, so you can see a, a two-year project from the standpoint of uh, it, at lease signing, uh, Harpo Studios was still standing on the site here. So starting the demolition, uh, working through uh, the final uh, core and shell designs, uh, building the core and shell, uh, our uh, core and shell contractor working under Sterling Bay, McHugh, uh, along with our TI contractor, ECI. Uh, ECI was, was physically chasing McHugh up the building uh, and completing the space. Uh, we were moving so quickly. So, so it was a very rapid uh, project that came, to very, came together very quickly. Gensler did the core and shell and then also built out this, uh, this ninth floor space yeah. that we have, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, super. And um, uh, the finishes for the public spaces as well. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Super. So, who was on the team? I mean, who was at the table in the beginning? Well, another interesting part of the process, uh, as we were moving uh, very quickly, uh, we were also, uh, you know, certainly in order to to maintain leverage in real estate negotiations, we wanted to to maintain the deal as confidentially as possible. So, we didn't release. Uh, the move downtown to our employees until we had the deal executed in June of, of 16. Uh, so obviously we were starting the design process, starting the, the workplace strategy uh, discussions with, uh, with our IA partners much earlier than that. And so, you know, it was not your typical uh, go back to your client, do the programming exercise around, um, you know, what, what are your needs within the space? Uh, and there, that was for a, a very specific purpose. As we looked at the cultural change that we wanted to drive, uh, we needed to, uh, to make some changes in the way that people thought about their workspace. And so that was a part of our workplace strategy. Uh, once we did sign the lease and we had an opportunity to announce to our employees, uh, then it really shifted very quickly into a significant change management effort. And uh, we pulled our employees in, pulled departments together. Uh, we gave them some input into neighborhoods and the space design. Uh, so we tried to engage them as much as possible at that point. Uh, but it uh, definitely shifted from a very core team of folks, uh, along with senior leadership that were guiding the project early on, to a very uh, large expanded team uh, once everyone was on board. Very interesting. It's kind of a little bit different. It's a little um, not the norm in terms of the way that uh, I've seen it done. And you told me a really kind of cute analogy as it related to asking the you know the the, the employees what they wanted, which is that Henry Ford story. Yeah. So you know Henry Ford's comment to you know turn of the century. Um, you know, if you ask people what what their needs are, it would be a faster horse, uh, as opposed to thinking in terms of. What is the next innovation? What is the next technology that's going to drive? And so that was a little bit of our process around workplace strategy and design of the headquarters is we wanted to create a vision for what we believed uh, could be a successful uh, work environment uh, to really uh, drive the company forward and drive that cultural change. Uh, so uh, we, we put these ideas together, drawing from the experience that we gained from the pilots presented those to senior leadership and gained uh, exceptional buy-in, and, and that's how we, we move forward. Yeah. And um, I know we'll talk about this more, Neil, when you uh, talk about the whole uh, design and workplace process, but how important it was to have uh, a project team that was really collaborative because you're moving fast, and this is complex and forward-thinking, and so, you know, just the, the whole idea of how the partners work together to make it happen. Yeah, it's, I think on our end, as, as the designers on the project, this would have never come to reality without our partners. I think two-year schedule, um, I think all of us kind of laughed, you're joking, and um, <laughs> at the beginning of it, and then we realized, no, you're serious, and we have to figure out how to do this. Um, and doing it, smart and using the talents of people outside of our own. So the idea of bringing a core group of great contractors, smart building teams, the real estate team that really knew how to kind of push us to that next level and get things accomplished. Even looking at your partners, I think in the future world, and we talked a little bit about it, the world we live in isn't a world of the architect gets the project and just runs with it. It's become complex and, and even in a building like this, the core and shell team rolled up their sleeves and worked hand in hand with us 
the developers to be able to deliver this by spreading apart to create the atrium would have never existed if we didn't have that relationship. There's also the relationship of the brand side to make sure that we're integrating that in and truly building a McDonald's space. You know, in a timeline like this, there's a lot of drivers that were given by the corporate team to make sure that we were um, successful. But there was a lot of evidence behind it that backed us up. So again, these pilots, not only on space pilots, technology pilots and the stuff that was being developed kind of behind the scenes helped us to get here so much faster than we could have if we just started two years ago, basically two years ago. <laughs> so let's continue. Let's talk about one of your favorite subjects, uh, workplace, workplace and design. So uh, I think we took a little bit of a different approach. Again, um, at the IA team, we've been partners with McDonald's for a while now, and I think we've been very fortunate to have the opportunity to kind of get to know them as a company and see all levels of it, the good, the bad, and how we can grow from those and, and kind of build this. We actually didn't have the ability to sit down and say, hey, what do you want in HR? We didn't really even kind of look at that. We got a blank sheet of paper to say, if you were going to build a space around culture and who you were as a company, what would it be? With a blank sheet of paper, and again, you don't sometimes get that. It's very different than what you look at a workplace strategy now. It used to be a programming. Give me the number of offices, conference rooms, what it is. This was a philosophy around what the space could be. So very different dialogue that started um, within. We also, our team rolled up the sleeves with the McDonald's real estate team because everything was kind of behind closed doors and read every press brief that the CEO made, every statement that came out um, about the company and the changing dynamic of the organization. Because what people didn't understand is McDonald's was changing culturally behind the scenes as we were building. Mm. Not, not anything different, but they were simplifying. They were coming up with ways of looking at things internally that nobody really would have known and it was very hard for us to discover without reading that document and reading, diving deep in. Um, so it was kind of an interesting approach to the strategy. I think we sat there for a long time going, where are we going to go with this? Um, and it turned into the building. Um, and then it moved into the design and then I think we talked a lot about the smart building technology as we were walking through. So again, we're going to dive into this building is pretty dynamic and amazing when you start to look at the stuff that you can't see. Um, that's the powerful thing about the building. So as you went through this process, you did formulate, there was design criteria that was sort of collaboratively formulated, and I think we've got three uh, big, big drivers. There's three, there's three main drivers They basically boil down. We started, um, I guess, if you can define the people, and so we talked with the human experience first, and then it kind of branched out. If we understand what people want, then you can start looking at the built environment. And the built environment should reflect the people. And if you get that right, then the culture will start to come out of that. So if you start thinking about how they all move and they interact, that relates to how it all started. And we didn't really, it was through observation of different pilot spaces, we could understand their movement patterns. Um, so one of the big drivers was really this idea of connecting people. So that was the big overview that we were looking at was, we need to not only connect the people inside at McDonald's, but we need to connect them to the, the users or their customer base. So again, working with um, the real estate team, it was really because of this one bucket helped us to really understand, even start to think about placement within the city was based off of that driver. How do we connect them not only internally with each other to the talent, but also with their customers? So there's this dynamic and then the reverse all the way back up to the C-suite. So that dynamic interaction was really powerful. That's part of the reason there's a giant stair here is to connect all those people. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just this idea of creating something cool. It was, it was clearly a driver from the CEO to make sure I can connect everybody. Mm -hmm. The next one that we really looked at was that idea of silos. Well, all we hear from clients is we built silos. I have this group working with this group and we're, we're, we're not talking fast enough. So we started to try and figure out, well, what does that look like? And the big driver is how do we actually showcase what we're working on in a more efficient way and how do we improve the interaction of the individual? So it kind of pushed us into this world of agile work. Um, we piloted it. We knew it kind of worked in one little aspect, but it was this idea of 
how do we get people to start talking to each other and showing each other their deck to be like, okay, like if I can meet with you, we can get something out the door faster and it doesn't need to be in a room. So we need to start to kind of open that world and blend that workforce. The other one, and these are, of course, you guys have seen all the, the we've walked through it, so you've seen <laughs> most of it, um, was creating a space that allows them to evolve and change over time, right? That's all we hear is flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. Well, what if the facility allows you to grow and change kind of all over the place? So you could work up here all day, and you see people working up here. So why do I have to build a workspace that I have to actually move stuff every single day? Why can't my people move and enjoy the, the space itself and go work in the conference center or go work down in, in HU? There's so many beautiful moments, and if I want to focus, I'm going to find those moments to go work in. So the flexibility is a very different dialogue. It's, the flexibility is choice and that idea of where do I go? Not what the thing is, but I can sit anywhere in this beautiful building. I mean, sitting here, I'm looking out at this skyline, which every so often I get lost in, right? You have those moments. That's the, the moments that make you smile, and that's the moments that make you happy and want to come into this space. So one of the bigger things that we started looking at, and this is a little, I, we debated putting it up here, we didn't actually talk about like who gets what. We started understanding the different work modes. So we decided, well, people work differently by themselves, and then we work differently collaboratively. So when you start looking at those different types of modes and understanding how they're going to move, we started to figure out, well, where would they go for these activities and how would they move throughout the building and how would that create the right amount of energy that McDonald's wanted to get out of their employees? They wanted people to start moving. So create a space that forces them to move and interact with each other. So that was really what it started with and kind of moved in to developing this unique palette of places and kit of parts and partnering with, um, we had a very interesting dynamic on the furniture and I think some of the furniture dealers probably hate us for this, but the design brief was really the idea of what if we created furniture that gave you a hug? And I explained it a little bit and we gave components over to them and said, these are the things and the types of spaces we want people to, to work in and we let them do their job. Again, I talked about the partnerships. Like, we went to them and said, you guys tell us how you would solve this. I'm not gonna force what I think it is. You design furniture every day. And some of the solutions that we're gonna show in the next slide is really these kit of parts that you saw throughout the floor plate were designed, and Technion was wonderful. They brought their engineers down to kind of help us design those solutions. And they said, this is what I would do for McDonald's soft curves around it, warm textiles that were designed by Suzanne Tick, back to that comfort. And it's, it's, yeah, the materiality is one thing, but it was the concept around culture that made it so powerful. Um, and you can start to see on the left up here, those are three different neighborhoods, from legal to HR. This unique palette works throughout the building. You guys walk through, I think, a technology floor on most of the tours. But um, I think the powerful relationship and the partnership with that dealer and our um, office rev and Technion was really a wonderful experience that got us to this solution that I don't think we would have got to if we just said, here, give me some six by six workstations. I heard over and over again, oh yeah, those Technion and office revolution people, they killed it. <laughs> so congrats. Now going back to that communication staircase and connectivity, just uh, it's a great visual of yeah. uh, what you were trying to do here. We actually sat in a room, I, I think we, this is a key um, moment of really saying, you know, we, we, we really looked at the partnerships. We, we designed like six stairs, walked in the room with McDonald's. Every week we'd meet with McDonald's, there wasn't a formal design process, so we kind of sat down. When we finally had to put a deck together at the end, it was like, oh, okay, we'll put together a presentation that we had to try and cobble everything together because it was so everybody working around the table. And that's how the stair was developed. We showed a few different options, spun it around and said, this is the one we want to go with, and off we went to the races. Perfect, perfect, thank you. So now we're going to start talking about technology. And Tom, you know, this is such an elegant solution and powerful and really uh, ahead of its time and so it's just such a great pleasure to have you here to talk about um, the, the uh, 
technology part of the equation. No, thanks for the opportunity. And it's wonderful to, to listen to, to my uh, partners here talking about this, from everything we want to do to changing our workforce and being a technology-driven company to inspiring uh, where we're going and to providing the flexibility around how we wanted to work. So we took a look at those and incorporated those into our thinking as well. It was really unique. We were brought in early. Um, we were brought in the, in the cone of silence and under the tent uh, early on before anyone knew we were actually uh, doing this because there was a tremendous amount of planning they had to go in place to make this happen. Uh, we had teams who were down here when the first concrete floors were being poured to determine where the wiring closets were going to actually be put in, in the building and actually started planning cabling and that. And the Waveguide team, I think, that's in here helped us a lot with the structured cabling and the work we did on the video stuff. I'll talk about it as well, too. But we were brought in very early to help design and think about these design principles and think about how we could support the flexibility of the workforce and to make the use of technology as seamless and invisible as possible. And someone mentioned the word invisible earlier. That was a big piece for us. It's really unique when you get an opportunity to come in with a clean slate in a new building. Many of us have grown up in buildings where the technology has been cobbled on top of one another and every room is different and everything looks different and it all works different and it's incredibly complicated and very difficult to use. When you're given that white sheet and clean piece of paper, it's really amazing what you can do if you're given the opportunity. So I was we're really thankful that we were brought in early to do this. And so when you take a look at some of the things we did, the, you know, we took a look at the workforce and came in with a mobile first strategy. We said we really wanted to eliminate desk phones as much as possible and we wanted to do that by providing everyone with a cell phone and providing seamless cellular service everywhere through the building to the point where um, I was on a video call today and, and a phone call today with my team. I drove in from outside into the parking garage, down to the parking garage, got in the elevator, went through the elevator, got off the elevator, walked into the room, and I was still on a video call. Can we all work here? That's incredible. <laughs> And so I'm driving in, and I've got the phone on my dashboard. They're watching me drive in, you know, it's, it's all the way in on a video conference call. But that, the ability to do that is absolutely amazing when you get it right. And so CDW and their team and what they did with us on the Wi-Fi, and we'll talk about that in a bit too, was absolutely amazing. A tremendous amount of work and planning and articulate work that had to be done. But on the, in the case of the cellular, that was really important that we provided cell service to everyone. We took away as many phones as possible. We have some strategically located where necessary, and we have the appropriate things in for E911 service. And it allowed us to eliminate a significant amount of cabling, but it allowed us to actually focus on how we used our phones. So we, we moved to a digital PBX, and there's a picture I don't have in here where we literally took a room half this size full of phone equipment, and it is now in a single cage six feet by a couple of feet wide and that's it. And the whole thing was replaced with that. And we gave everyone the ability to determine how their phone would ring, whether the outside number would come through, whether they had voicemail, whether their voicemail didn't go anywhere, what their phone calls looked like when they called from out inside the building out. So we gave everyone options on how they wanted their phone service to look and act for them. And that was a piece of the customization. It was rather unique. When we look at the desks and the workspaces, monitors on all the desks with, the, with their articulating arms, and uh, providing standardized USB docking stations. So everyone plugs in, everything just works. And we, do, we didn't provide keyboard and mice. There was this U factor or E factor or whatever. Nobody really wanted to use someone else's keyboard or mouse. So we left that out. But standardized on the, on the actual workspaces. So when you go from one desk to another, everything is exactly as it was on the last one. So you don't have to think twice about it. That was a key piece of this was standardization across the board. We installed the tech bar, which you may have seen, where we provide on-site tech service, which is really awesome. So with all the technology in the building, if you need help, you walk up and get help now. You don't have to schedule someone to come and see you or actually have someone do a site visit, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. So that was a big piece of it as well, too. Printing, we centralized printing. We took away all the personal printers. We took away all the, the things we had hidden under our desks. We actually centralized, centralized our printing and allowed printing to follow you. So you print and it shows up where you need it to be, which was really quite amazing. The, uh, the Wi-Fi, I'm sorry, the Wi-Fi experience was another piece just like the cell service. It works everywhere, as I mentioned. When you come in the building, all the way out into the verandas, seamlessly everywhere you go, into the bathrooms, wherever you're at, Wi-Fi will work seamlessly. You forget it's there, but it allows you to work across the workspace without thinking about being connected and about worrying about being connected. It really changes the experience completely. Video was a big piece of the change for us. We went from being a phone service company where we were all on 
phone calls and audio calls and bridge calls. And we basically moved to a video first approach. So the idea was when you walk into a room, we took away the 15 minutes of getting everything to work to you walk in and push a button and a video call starts. If you don't have your video on, it's a voice call, but it's a video call to start with. And we went from the culture of video being an event to video being the way you work. And it took a while culturally. It was, you know, if I'm going to be on a video call, I need to be home all dressed up and, you know. Now, I mean, you're, you're talking to people and the cat's walking in front of the camera, people are crawling in bed behind them. And it took a while, but everyone got used to it. Which you can do as long as you've and got a happy that's, meal. That's just the work. Yeah, this is the, but it really became, it took a while, but the culture then became, you know, how come your video's not on? And when you walk around the building, you just see big heads on screens and big peoples and houses. And people got used to the fact that you're calling them at 10 o'clock at night somewhere else in the country. And guess what? They have a life, right? Mm. No different than us. So it allowed you to actually, wait, read in a way, connect with people and their real lives versus everything being artificial. So I kind of took down some, the guard. We, allow, we have wireless sharing. So when you walk in a room, no more cables to plug in your laptops. Everybody can share on the screen. Push a button. Software is on your laptop. It works. The software for your video conferencing is all there. It works on your phone. It works on your laptop. It works on the thing on the desk. Every time you walk into a room, it's the same everywhere you go. To the point now where meetings are now like a change of guard. You come up to the rooms now, and in a minute before, people are lined up outside. You hit the minute, people change the guard in and out. They go, and they're, they push a button, they're working, and the next meeting starts. It was never like that before, so quite impressive. I was going to ask, you know, that you do have meeting rooms, so how does that work? And I think one of the things, too, is, you know, we talked a little bit about it is, hearing that, that's what's exciting. Like, that McDonald's invested in the technology side. We could have never developed an agile workflow in this type of building if they weren't on board. It would have been a train wreck coming in here if everybody, their technology wasn't working. One of the things, and you'll see kind of the slide up here, we tested, and I told the tour, we tested every single conference room. We taped out the lines, we figured out the angle of the table, figured out where the power needed to be, we looked at the materials, we looked at the way that it had to operate, this was months in advance yes. to moving in here because we wanted you to be able to walk in that room, cool. push one button, and not worry. That's a lot to deal with, but gosh, it made that first day a lot easier for people oh. in this building. Yeah, we had, we had mock-ups of all the rooms. and all, <laughs> I remember walking through it. It was amazing. And then the rooms, to your, your, your question of the rooms, all fully integrated, integrated with our Microsoft Office 365 for scheduling rooms and booking rooms and, and unbooking rooms uh, if people don't show up. Um, absolutely fantastic, all seamless, all fully integrated with all the building technology uh, in mind. So a lot of pieces came together, but a lot of planning and a lot of time to get it done. We're going to have to have another session on change management and training, you know, good. all of the employees on how to use this technology because you can have it and if they don't use it or don't know how to use it, it doesn't do you any good. But it seems like every employee that I've met, you know, is just so excited and is really into it. Yeah, we may, not, we may not get to it. I know we're running kind of time, but we actually did some surveys with our workforce to actually get some of the answers around that. And it was quite impressive what we found out. So if we get time, we'll talk about that as well. I want to shift the conversation a little bit to the smart building uh, concept. And I do want to give a shout out also to Sterling Bay and Gensler. This is a lead platinum building. And so there's a lot of thought and energy that went into, you know, outside in and inside out and making it, you know, the best that it could be. So, Scott, can you talk a little bit about, you know, the business goals around smart building? Sure, sure. It's just smart building, uh, there's a lot of buzz around smart building right now. And, uh, you know, the question that we oftentimes get are, is really around uh, how did you determine what direction to go? There's so many different directions you can go with smart building components and integration of technology. And uh, I, I would echo the, the shout out to Sterling Bay uh, and to uh, the landlord side um, working with us on the infrastructure to put in place to be able to support smart building because uh, there is a significant handoff between what's base building and what's uh, tenant systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of integration work that went in, uh, into that on the front end. But even prior to that, we, we needed to develop a strategy around smart building. And so uh, credit to uh, the JLL uh, smart buildings team that we worked with from a consulting standpoint. Uh, we sat down and we talked about and, and really went back to uh, what we talked about as the project overall or what are the business drivers uh, that we can attach to smart building uh, that uh, not only create uh, potential payback from energy efficiency and, uh, and cost savings around those issues, 
but what can we do that will ultimately impact the, the drivers that we are trying to achieve with the, the project as a whole? And, uh, and so what you see in our smart building approach is a significant emphasis on the user experience and creating a level of convenience, uh, a level of comfort uh, that is uh, clearly expressed to the employees. Uh, and again, it goes back to the notion of driving innovation, creating an innovation mindset. Uh, we implemented a, a workplace app uh, that's on every employee's phone. They have the ability to download uh, where they can do navigation throughout the building, they can book a room, they can get transportation information, uh, they can change the temperature in their conference room or in their work area. And so all of these functions uh, can be uh, addressed elsewhere with different processes, but what the, the Workplace app does is it brings it all together in one format uh, at a level of convenience. Uh, think in terms of you're traveling in on the train in the morning, oh, I forgot to book a conference room for my 9 o'clock uh, meeting this morning. You can do that right on the train from your mobile device on the Workplace app. Uh, so a level of convenience, uh, the employee experience was really a major driver as we looked at uh, what's a part of our smart building program. And I love this. Uh, it just takes a very complex process and makes it so simple. Smart building plus smart workplace equals a smart experience. Very cool. So you've touched on some of it, but the components, uh, some of the components of the smart building. Yeah, so you know, I touched on uh, a lot of the functionality and you know, the, the interesting, the, the feedback that we're getting, um, the positive feedback that we're getting is really around those functions that have such a direct impact to the employee experience and the ability for an employee to go in and adjust the temperature in their space is huge. And the credit to uh, Comfy uh, as a systems provider, system of record, um, working with the Comfy team, working with Siemens, uh, again, working with Sterling Bay, uh, ECI from an integration standpoint, uh, we were able to put together a package that is essentially a, a couple of touches on your smartphone device to either warm or cool the conference room or the work area that you're in. Uh, so again, it's impacting that employee experience, that user experience where we've seen the greatest return just from a satisfaction standpoint. Absolutely. Uh, you have touched on the Workplace app. I don't know if you saw in the invitation that you got, but there was a link so you could download the guest app onto your phone, and you could have used it while you were walking around the building to didn't have all the features of being an employee, but kind of gave you an idea of how cool it is to have this uh, capability. And the conversation keeps coming back around to the human experience and really, um, you know, driving that home from every different perspective. So um, um, how did you collaborate to create this unified employee experience? Just a couple of maybe top level comments. Well, maybe, maybe if I can. Um, one of the things we did when we were thinking about how we move people here and how the building operates is we put a group together. We call it Working Futures. And this group is made up of HR people, communications, workplace solutions, communications, lots of different functions. But it serves as the kind of uh, pulse check on the building, how it's working, what do we need to adjust, listening to employees and then reacting so that there's a group that's thinking about that constantly. So I'll give you a couple of tiny examples. So cultural change. Some people in IT, I think, they were consultants. Perhaps. They were consultants, <laughs> I think, were worried that videos in every room meant they were being spied on, yeah. right? So you'd walk into conference rooms and there'd be post-it notes over all of the video yeah. screens, you know, over the cameras, um, because right. someone had thought that that was going to happen. Um, so you could react to that. You could deal in a communications way to just kind of dispel these myths. Another one was um, with flexible workplace seating. It was, okay, this is the neighborhood. And so people say, oh, you can sit anywhere, just not here because this is ours. Uh, and we're going to put things on the desk so you can't actually sit here. So it's just helping people work through those changes in the way they work um, in a positive way. So rather than telling them you can do this, you can't do that, it was giving them more guidelines and support to just help them through the change. So I think that Working Futures group, which still exists today and is still planning um, uh, the future here, uh, was a really important thing that we did to listen and react to employees. Just tagging on to the human experience piece, in some cases it was just as important in understanding the things that we didn't move forward with that contributed to that human experience. And so one example of that 
with the mobile app, we had the technology uh, tracking the, the Bluetooth signal on a mobile device to be able to locate a colleague. So if I wanted to find Neil, he's working somewhere else in the office, we had a technology that both of us could opt in, and if you opted in, I could request Neil to find him, and it would show me exactly where he's located in the building. And so as we brought that to the Working Futures Group, we had a very robust discussion around, you know, is this a direction that we want to go? While there's a convenience factor there, there's also a big brother watching uh, potential, uh, you know, expectation or, or a perception that our employees may have. And so we were very cautious in balancing convenience and technology with privacy and employee concerns. And we elected not to put that into the functionality of the Workplace app. Uh, but that also contributes to the, the human experience. <laughs> And I think to, from a technology perspective, as you said, making it seamless, bringing your, the, the technology that you use at home and you're really just bringing it right into the office was huge in terms of uh, that overall employee experience. It's actually accurate that the IT team was the one who identified the cameras being covered and brought it to the working team. <laughs> brought it to you. It was a while back, so oh. it's easy to get it mixed up. But, uh, I love this kind of collaboration. <laughs> Fabulous. But it was great. We were actually working in those teams together, and the, the key was, I think the key message for all of us, we had a common goal, yeah. And, yeah. and being able to share that and, and putting the pieces together was the most important. Yeah. So getting to the uh, last little segment, um, you know, we've talked about the, you know, the how and the whys, but measuring what matters is so important. And so I asked, you know, you know, how have, have you, you know, did you even think about measurement away up front, or and, and what are the th kinds of things that you're tracking? So to start, maybe we'll start with uh, corporate real estate, and uh, what are you looking at in terms of the measurements, and how are you doing? Sure, sure. So with the um, the technology that we put into the building, uh, one of the things that we want to ensure uh, around smart building as well was. Uh, that we had the opportunity to better understand and drive better utilization of our real estate. And so we have put sensor technology into the building, uh, so we're able to, to track presence, uh, we're able to identify um, uh, the, the numbers of people in a particular space. Uh, we're still adding to that layer of technology and refining that a bit, but uh, we're, we're getting badge data, uh, so we, we're able to understand that. Um, one of the concepts that uh, was part of our guiding principles and initiatives coming in was this notion of unassigned space and the ability to flex. And we designed for 80% of our headcount uh, from, uh, from a seat count standpoint. And so what we've seen uh, with the utilization information that we actually just reviewing last week, we're actually averaging about 73% uh, as far as the utilization. So the percentage of our employees and con full-time contractor base that are coming into the office is under that 80% uh, threshold that we designed to. 80% for us was a conservative number. We probably could have pushed that a little bit lower, uh, but that helps us to address incremental growth and uh, future changes as we go forward. So now, good conversation. I think when the strategy is, do we plan for 70 or 80%? Because that's another floor on the building. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Sterling Bay was happy that we went with 80%. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, you had told me that reducing costs or reducing square footage per person, that those were not really real estate drivers for you. And yet, as a result of deploying new ways of working, you had some pretty spectacular results on, on the financial side as well. Yeah, it, it was really a byproduct. So, you know, what the drivers were really around meeting the business goals, but as a byproduct of that, we were able to reduce uh, from a million square feet in Oak Brook to the half a million square feet that we have here. So pretty significant uh, space reduction. Cool. Then technology, how, what are you tracking and uh, why is it important? Yeah, so a lot of interesting things we learned. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the survey that we did in conjunction with our workplace team. But, you know, interesting things too, at, at the very forefront, you may have seen by the tech bar a vending machine that we have up there that actually provides peripherals, et cetera. But one of the things we did was we supplied everyone with headsets before they came for being on the phone. But, you know, I think the workforce anticipated we were going to be coming to wooden floors, picnic tables, on, on cardboard boxes, and sitting shoulder to shoulder, screaming to the point where we all had to have headsets on so we could actually work. What we find now is that 
there are far fewer people using headsets than we thought in the building. They'll use them when they need to get on a private call and they want some privacy, but the building was designed so well and the spaces to move away and work changed that expectation. So one of the things we learned that we, we didn't even anticipate measuring was the expectations of, of the workforce and what we actually found. But we ran, ran a little bit of survey in uh, early, I think it was about October, was when it occurred mm -hmm. last year. And in there, we had a set of technology, and we had about 900 participants with over 50% response rate. It was pretty impressive. And you can see just generally the green on that and the yellow and the green on here, but really what we learned from this and what we got from everyone was it, it really worked well. Ease of use, seamless, seamless support. We spent, one thing we didn't talk about, we spent as much time on preparing training and the change management of the, for the training of the technology as we did on actually building the technology. And one of the th feedback we got was training was so simple to use. We brought everyone through structured classes. We had, we had war rooms where people could go in and get help. We, took, uh, we onboarded everyone with every piece of technology, understood how to use it when they came in the building the days they were starting. And we did it in waves. And it really helped significantly. But what we got from everyone too was things are just working smoother, faster. We're more productive. We get things done that we couldn't get done before because we're not dealing with technology. And if you look at the, the next slide with some of the stats, some of the things I talked about, if you look at just what happened, what we were using blue jeans for video conferencing, we went from 676 meetings to 19,000, almost 20,000 meetings a month on video conferencing when we moved into this building. That, you, get, you get the perspective of what that changed when you're dealing with meetings and people working face to face and collaborating in, in real time as, as humans versus on the phone and actually, and, and as I said, having a video conference at an event, it's quite amazing. The number of minutes we use, up to three million minutes in one month now that we're actually connecting the workforce with each other in other places around the globe, which is really quite impressive. Printers, you can see that, but then also down there where I talked about uh, the, the actual technology for the, the phone service went down to six square feet, so we actually shrunk everything. So not only did we improve everything, our footprint and everything we had got smaller. Less printers, less technology, less phones. Everything went smaller, but it became simpler and easier to use across the board. So we measure this on a regular basis. We will be doing more surveys with our, our user base. We also take a look at our service desk and our calls. And we had you know, the initial bump when we came in, it was less than we thought, but the, the amount of calls we get relative to technology issues is far smaller than it was before we came to this building. Amazing, fantastic. And Jazz, last but not least, employee satisfaction. Sure. Well, I guess at the end of the day, people vote with their feet. Uh, so they choose to work with us and for us, or they choose to work somewhere else. Um, one of the concerns we had after you know nearly 50 years in Oprah when we moved down here was, are people going to stay with us? Am I going to see a <laughs> jump in turnover, churn rates? Um, and the cost of hiring in that new talent would be significant. So I'm very pleased to say um, we saw no change in our turnover rates at all in the move down here. Um, and in terms of interest in people working for us, in the first month alone that we were here, we had 22,000 applications uh, to work in our corporate office. Um, and this was with no advertising. And we use LinkedIn quite a lot, but um, you know our, our um, presence on LinkedIn now is one of the most popular um, and being in the West Loop is, is a key part of that actually as well um, you know that phrase West Loop uh, drives an awful lot of traffic to us so we're very pleased with the overall results um, you know it's we, we haven't been here a year yet so uh, we'll, we'll see how that settles down we're going through our first winter as well so people who used to drive 10 minutes to work and now getting the train downtown and getting on a shuttle etc but I think things like having a shuttle service for all our employees, free of charge, uh, that runs you know, morning and evening helps with that. Huge. The fact that we gave everyone a, a monthly travel allowance for the first year just to help them get into the swing of traveling. So we gave everyone $100 a month um, for the first 12 months just to help them you know, get over that initial change, um, supporting them with workshops around. You know, a lot of people had never commuted. Uh, now, I come from London. I had a two-hour commute each way every day, so this is a breeze for me. Uh, but uh, a lot of our people had never commuted. So just helping them learn about that and supporting them through that has, I think, been very helpful. So going back to your talent acquisition, business driver, and access to talent yep. results? Yeah, well, we had a 22% increase in um, uh, attraction rates um, and actual people coming on board. So. Um, 
that was very positive from from a attracting talent point of view. And maybe at the last, you know, you had great CEO support and you know engagement at the beginning during the process. And now, what does he say? And how, uh, you know, what what does he say in terms of the results that that you've delivered? Yeah, I mean, Steve Easterbrook, who's our chief exec, is. Uh, uh, I think very proud of this building and the move. Uh, he's very personally involved. I can I can tell you about a two-hour meeting we had about what we call the place. I remember at one point we were finalizing plans to move and um, someone said, what, what's it called? We were like, oh, bugger. Uh, <laughs> what, have we all agreed what we're calling this? And so, uh, you know, Steve was in, intimately involved in that as well. So, you know, from those very small things but that are very meaningful, you know the overall strategy he's, he's very engaged throughout and he's been a great driver and supporter of it great I think one of the uh, probably the, uh, the the greatest measures of success is now we are rolling the the workplace strategy out to our field offices so our US field offices we're reducing footprints there by 50% so significant savings and real estate costs there uh, all of the concepts around space uh, around technology um, what we put in place around the collaboration tools uh, we're rolling that out uh, in the U.S. and in many cases we're looking at uh, technology rollouts globally to better facilitate uh, as a center of excellence here those communications that need to take place with our with our global employees. So the notion that the successes here are now uh, from senior leadership standpoint are being asked to, to permeate throughout the rest of the yeah. organization are a, a key measure of the success here. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's really interesting you mentioned that we um, everyone from the outside, when they connect into McDonald's, uh, and, and when we're in here, they get an amazing experience when they connect to the rooms here. The video conferencing systems are fun fantastic. The audio quality, they can hear everyone in the room. No lost, no, no lost voices, you got directional microphones to track people, it's crazy cool. So now, everyone wants their offices to mimic what we're doing here. So we're now rolling this out around the globe, and we actually, our office in Shoreditch, which was in the UK, which was about three years ago, we literally, we, we retrofit that with new technology, we're literally upgrading, that was a benchmark at the time, we're now upgrading the technology in that office again to match what we've done here. So it's spreading across the globe now, everyone wants to operate the way we are here. Okay, very quickly, your single biggest lesson learned during this process so I think for us, uh, you know, we, we talked briefly on the change management piece, but uh, one of our lessons learned was change management doesn't cease at move in. And so, you know, there's been a continuing effort. Part of the workplace, Working Futures Group uh, is driving some of that change management, but to continue to hone uh, the, the culture when we think in terms of just meeting space, for instance, and how we use meeting space and the technology there. You know, that continual education and that change management piece for us has been a continuing focus and a, and a lesson learned. I would say mine, and I've said it before, is assemble a team of partners that truly are the best in class. Um, from your technology side to your internal teams to your communication teams, it, it makes a project. If you get along and you're building that, it goes so smoothly. As crazy as this was over the last two years, Having the right contractor, the right team on board made it work so much easier. And uh, that was a lesson learned for us is um, I, every time we look for those right people that, you know, they're going to take me through the, to the end state. Start with technology sooner than your facilities people will let you. <laughs> That's a lesson. No, I would say it ties into uh, everything. It, it, it's going to sound very familiar, but uh, planning ahead of time working together as a team and having a unified outcome is absolutely critical. The change management, the training, all of that, and bring the onboarding process that judges could talk about, just being very methodical about that and very thoughtful and learning to adapt very, very quickly, especially once you start bringing people in, that's very important. Uh, I'd, I'd just say quickly, you, you probably don't move corporate offices very often in your career. so. Um, you know, the attention to detail, the effort and the sophistication that went into it, I think has all paid off um, from even we interviewed every single um, junior person who was going to show our people around on the first day. And we accepted about 50% of the people that applied because we knew that day one experience, as we called it, was going to be so important to set the tone. We took our 
um, uh, receptionists, we call them guest experience leaders, and we used our hospitality training that we develop in store to interview, select, and train those guest experience leaders, which hopefully you'll see when you come into our office. So all of these small things all help to create a culture. So that attention to detail, I think, was uh, critical. Very cool. I'm going to skip. We have a short video which I'll play after you have your wine in hand. Uh, but I think we can jump right to a couple of questions uh, from the audience. And let's give this panel like a huge uh, round of applause. Fantastic. Yeah, Oak Brook is. Um, we have we don't have anyone there. We have one. We have one small building. We call it Seven Eleven. It's on Jerry Boulevard, where we have some shared service people. Um, so that will will stay. Uh, that's a leased office. Um, but our main campus and our Plaza building, where our U.S. Uh, team were, are both empty. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you looking? Yeah. <laughs> you could be a hero here. So we yeah. can make a great uh, deal on a, a suburban yeah. campus property. Let's <laughs> bring up the photo of the campus and get one more time. Yeah. Just leave that up there. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, to, to answer that question, we've, we've gone through the marketing process. Uh, we've been successful with a number of uh, our uh, outbuildings, so to speak, the main campus. We're still marketing. Uh, we're, we're pretty close on a deal with uh, the U.S. headquarters near uh, Oak Brook Mall, uh, but that's a process that we're still working through. Hi. Who developed the um, app? the app that the employees use and then also you talked a lot about the training everybody got on the technology how are you doing that for uh, new hires coming in sure so I'll talk to the app and then Tom if you want to talk to the technology training um, from a from a mobile app standpoint um, we looked at a number of different options uh, in working with our JLL smart buildings consulting team uh, JLL was also looking at an opportunity to expand their offering around uh, a mobile app that they could make available to other clients. So it really was the perfect timing of a joint merger between the two of us, co-development, working with a company called Kone, K-O-N-Y, not the elevator folks, K-O-N-E, uh, but Kone uh, with JLL and McDonald's jointly developed uh, the, the workplace mobile app and then uh, we continue to work with Kone from a support standpoint. And I'm going to defer to, to Jess to talk a little bit about the onboarding process because we're a part of it from a technology perspective, but I think it'd be really interesting to hear what we do when we bring a new employee in. Yeah, uh, one of the things we were keen to do when we moved out of Oakbrook was to not forget our heritage um, and bring all the good things with us, but use it as a moment to say, actually, we're not happy with this or we're not happy with that, so we're not going to take it with us. So it was a real, we drew a line you know, with lots of different departments, and one of those was our onboarding process. So I know Tom and my teams work really closely together to develop a brand new onboarding process that starts from the moment someone is, uh, accepts their job offer. We now have a cool way of uh, talking to them in advance. We use a, a technology called Enboarder, which uses text communication to those people. Enboarder, E-N, and then border. Um, and so what it helps do is, is acclimate people to McDonald's before they actually start. Um, build that excitement, you know, by the time someone comes in for their welcome day, as we call it, we already know what phone they like, what laptop they want, they've chosen their laptop bag, Tom's team turn up, do a, a tech fair with them to make sure it all works, they have you know, a real white glove experience, their boss knows um, what their favorite foods are, what their favorite McDonald's thing is, and at the end of their welcome day, we, we bring them up here and we, we celebrate their arrival with their team. So everyone comes up, we toast their um, arrival into the business. So it's a, it's a real kind of um, uh, collaborative affair. But what we found is the, the experience of new starters is just streets ahead of where, where it was before we came down here. Will 
it has a huge impact on how long you stay with the company, how you feel about the company, and therefore your the effort and the business that you make back. Yeah. So having this is, you know, it's a huge win-win. Sure. Thank you. You've been great. And, um, you know, I would just like to say that this is what we is all about. We are trying to create these inter- uh, create these uh, interdepartmental, uh, interdisciplinary conversations because it takes a village to literally create a huge success and drive businesses forward. And um, our next big uh, event is at, in Atlanta at Facility Fusion in April. So if you are interested, you know, you can go right online and, and look at Facility Fusion. And uh, then we'll be doing more here. We had the pleasure of being at the William Blair headquarters uh, six months ago or so, which was fascinating and fabulous. And we've got some really great things planned, too, for in the future for the Chicago area. So, again, thank you so much. Food and drink, the bar is open. Thank you all.